Wow, what a great way to start. Open up your heart from our original world musical Sitaram featuring Isaiah Robinson and members of our Voice of Chicago. Good evening, everyone. My name is Josephine Lee. I'm the president and artistic director of the Chicago Children's Choir. I'm joined by my co-moderator. Hello, everyone. My name is Albert Corellis. I am president of the Singers Council of Voice of Chicago. Uh, throughout today's fireside chat with Mr. Kotner, if you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the Q&A section. We'll get to them in the second half of the discussion. I am so honored to introduce you to this extraordinary, uh, I, I was going to say young man, but you are an extraordinary, <laughs> uh, extraordinary um, award-winning film director, producer, writer, who was named one of Hollywood's fastest rising stars by The Hollywood Reporter. Uh, Mr. Cotner grew up just outside Indianapolis in uh, Kokomo, Indiana. He graduated from Pitzer College in California, where he went on to serve as executive producer at Paramount, as well as senior vice president of acquisitions at Open Road Films. Uh, he's now working as producer, uh, er, er, he's now working uh, with A24 Films uh, Film Productions as senior vice president of acquisitions. He has worked on such films as An Inconvenient Truth, American Teen, Mad Hot Ballroom, A Haunted House, Side Effects, The Gray, and End of Watch. And as producer, Kotner has worked on shows like Medal of Honor, we're gonna just keep going, Making of a Murderer, Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat, they should all watch this, by the way, Ugly Delicious, love that show, Somebody, Feed Phil, Rotten, The Keepers, just to name a few. Uh, and working with documentary maker Ryan White, Kotner wrote and directed the 2014 documentary, The Case Against Eight, which examines the landmark Supreme Court case that overturned California's ban on same-sex marriage and the lives of those closest to that faith. Uh, mm -hmm. The Case Against Eight won Kotner a U.S. documentary directing, directing prize at Sundance Film Festival and was nominated for an Emmy, Emmy and for Outstanding Achievement in Production at the 2015 Cinema Eye Honors. And just this past February, Kotner became a member of the documentary branch of the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences. Welcome, Ben Kotner. Thank you so much. I am so excited to be here. I appreciate you having me. So, um, so let's get started. Where did your interest in film originate? Well, uh, Albert mentioned I'm from Kokomo, Indiana, which is a relatively small town, about probably three hours drive from Chicago, um, closer to Indianapolis. And I grew up in that kind of small town where I didn't really fit in and it didn't really feel like that was my world. And for me, going to back then, you had to go to a video store to get movies. I don't know if you guys know what those were, but like a blockbuster video or something where you actually have to physically go and get a VHS tape. And that's how I kind of discovered movies and and I didn't even think about it in terms of it being a career path because I think I had never been exposed to that being an option for something that somebody from my town could do. Uh, not many people from my town ever left my town even just to travel but generally just stayed there for most of their lives and it instilled in me I think a really big desire to explore the world because cinema can show you so many different things and places and different types of peoples and to different ways of living um, and you know I, they're great directors like Greg Araki that I don't even know how his movies made it into video stores back then but they did he was kind of a groundbreaking queer director and I found those movies and, and it wasn't really until later in life that it clicked that, you know, all along movies have played that part in my life of kind of exposing new things to me. And I think that's the thing I, I've, I've enjoyed about working in the space the most is that I get to explore new worlds and it feels like I'm in school constantly every year I'm learning about a new subject and it's like going to college permanently. Um, uh, and getting to, and then getting, getting also to kind of um, help, let, work with other people to discover those kinds of stories as well. It's similar to music, actually, right? Yeah. Um, a, lot there, a lot of parallel. Was there a particular experience that captured and held your attention? Well, you know, I, later in life, I, I went to college and I didn't at the time know I was one of those kids who, who really didn't figure out for a while what I wanted to do. It wasn't like I was a, an obsessive film buff who always knew that. Um, I went to school and I thought I was going to study environmental science. 
Um, and some lame professor basically told me that there was no hope that the world was going to be saved. So there was no point. And I was like, that's a weird thing to tell, tell a student. So <laughs> I started looking at other areas and, um, and media studies was one of the things that stood out to me. And so it, getting to know film and understanding the influence of media on our lives and how things like advertising affects the way that we think about the world mm -hmm. and that you can all of a sudden have a new consciousness about the way that you consume media uh, was something that really riveted me. So when I left school, I wanted to work in film industry. I knew that by that point, even though it wasn't a realization I made until pretty close to the end of college, and I was just looking for different um, um, uh, ways to do that. I was maybe going to be an editor or anything. And I, and I came across a job that, uh, at Paramount Studios, which I was really lucky to get, like an entry-level job there, where my job was to essentially watch all the submitted films of people that are looking for distribution. So I would watch all of the bad movies. And eventually, I got to go to Sundance Film Festival. and. Um, that it was 2004, I, or we yeah, had somewhere around 2004. It was the year we bought Mad Hot Ballroom, which everyone on this call should watch. It's one of the best documentaries ever. It's fantastic. Um, and it exposed me to documentaries and it exposed me to independent filmmaking and it exposed me to like this whole world. And so I think sun, for me, Sundance has always been a through line of inspiration. I think maybe the way that CCC is a part of people's lives, like Sundance has come become that for me. Mm -hmm. So you've sort of come at filmmaking from all of these different angles as a writer, producer, director. Um, can you just tell us a bit about sort of how you've interacted with those different roles, what you enjoy doing the most? Yeah, thank you. Um, I I feel really blessed that I've gotten to, to to try things from a lot of different angles. For me, directing was never something I, I really studied for or um, formal training in. It was something that I always knew I wanted to to do, especially in documentaries. Um, but it, directing is a very you know complicated process that requires training. For me, it was um, I knew that I there was a subject that I was interested in exploring. And it was just, I felt a compulsion to pick up a camera and start filming it. And it was one of those things where usually you have to wait for someone's permission to do it. And I didn't do that. And, and, and I think that's an important thing that I would share with everybody on this call is a lot of people like that professor who told me that environmental studies was a waste of my time. Uh, I had a, a film professor who said, well, you, I wanted to make a movie in college. And, and she told me, well, that's too hard to do. And that was, you know, maybe realistic advice at the time, but I, I think so often in life, like we wait for people's permission to do things. Mm -hmm. And actually you have it in your power if you're really passionate enough to do it, just do it. So that's what, when I started making the case against state, it was just about getting a camera and, and, and actually like reaching out for support from people who do have more expertise. So I partnered with Ryan. Um, and, and I think for me, but then on the flip side of things, producing and being an executive on films is a true honor for me because I get to support other filmmakers and I get to learn from them and I get to give input and help them achieve the stories that they want to tell. And there's something entirely rewarding in a, in a much different way. So I love being able to do both. Uh, like filmmaking is something that if you're making, if you're directing a film, you have to pour your soul into it and it, it becomes a part of your life for several years usually so you really have to, to know that so for me it's something personally that i wouldn't want to do that every year with a film it's like you really have to wait for the right thing to come along that you feel inspired to tell that story mm -hmm. in that vein of you know interacting with film media in different ways um, what do you find most fulfilling about your work? What sort of aspects of the job really, you know, make you keep working at it? I think it's, it's the, it's the learning new things. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I, I think I get bored if I'm not like always learning something new and, and that curiosity drives me to, um, you know, like, especially in picking documentaries because you do get to, to get, you throw yourself into a world that you didn't know anything about and learn about it. Um, so that for me is probably the most valuable part of it. So Ben, what inspires you? 
Um, I'm inspired by people and things that look at things differently. Um, and that's, I think when I'm thinking about what kind of projects that I like to, to work on, it really doesn't matter to me the subject. I, I've made things about football. I'm not a big football fan. <laughs> I've made, you know, I, I, just a, a wide variety of things that it, it really hasn't, doesn't have so much to do with the subject. It's that I, I love and appreciate when I see something is seeing it from a different perspective than I've ever seen before and changes my perception about it. And I, I think I find joy in that. And I think that uh, all, all art does that. I think that's not unique to cinema. I think music does that a lot in terms of when you're singing a song that someone else wrote, you're seeing the world through their eyes. Um, and I think that's what inspires me is when people are able to make connections that you didn't necessarily see before and share that with someone. That's so important. And you're such an incredible storyteller. How have you been um, coping with the pandemic? I know you're in LA right now. Well, I, yeah, uh, it's been, it's been, I, I count myself to be very lucky in many respects. Um, still working very hard and um, safe. And, and, and I think we can't take for granted all of those things. Um, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's hard in a lot of ways because a lot of the things you want to rush out and do creatively. You have to take a more slow and measured approach, but there's also a reward to that that I find I've, I've had the opportunity to put a little bit more thought into the projects that I am working on and really opened up new ways of approaching them that is a, 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 kind, a kind of a gift in terms of having that time and, and space to reflect on things. Mm. Okay. So, uh, the case against eight is among the most notable pieces of your film career. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about the process of making that, you know, what got you into the idea of, you know, making a film about this case? Uh, what, what sort of led you to making this movie? Yeah, so um, like I said, you know, having worked at Paramount for a while, I learned that like I was very attracted to documentaries more than like every festival I went to, those were the films that I loved the most. And so I was always kind of keeping an eye out for a story that might compel me to want to film it. And when I found out that some friends were involved in an organization that was going to be um, submitting this lawsuit, which was a historic lawsuit that brought together one of the most conservative lawyers in the world, with one of the most liberal lawyers in the world to, to collectively fight against a ban on same-sex marriage, which at the time there really weren't many Republicans that were willing to make that, um, that leap. So it made a lot of headlines. It was a big kind of uh, odd couple pairing. So I thought there was an interesting story there. And I, I also uh, knowing the plaintiffs and having met, met them very early on in the process, knowing that their stories of what the experience of going through this lawsuit would be like was something that I was very curious to understand what that would mean. When you look back at historic civil rights cases that have gone to the Supreme Court, um, the loving decision, things like that, how that impacted those people. I'd never seen a film that really took you inside that experience of our unique justice system. Um, and so I early on approached the uh, lawyers and the plaintiffs involved and asked them if they would be interested in. It was one of those things in, in filmmaking and especially verite filmmaking, which um, for those of you who don't know verite is when you're following people doing essentially what they're doing in their normal life. Um, less like interviews, it's more um, just following them in the moment like a fly on the wall. Mm -hmm. um, to get that kind of trust, especially in a legal suit when everyone's very protective of their information, of their privacy. Um, we spent a lot of time developing those relationships so they would feel comfortable and natural with us having cameras in the room while this was happening. And that was a process that took months. Um, and we actually filmed for five years. And we, at, in the beginning, we didn't know that the case would actually make it to the Supreme Court. It, act, the odds were actually pretty low that it would. Um, but we thought it would be an interesting story nonetheless. And lo and behold, five years later, we're on the steps of the Supreme Court watch, watching history being made and trying to hold back tears. And 
Um, and I, I, I think I'll always cherish that experience, not just for having seen it and what it means for me personally, but for having been able to create a document that we can share with other people. And we've heard a lot from, you know, parents of LGBT people uh, who, you know, they, they've seen it and it's helped them understand. And I think that's what we always wanted to do was make a film that people who don't necessarily relate to or live that experience could understand it in a way. Um, and, and, and that is such an honor to be able to have that experience where you change people's hearts and, and minds through something like that. That's so powerful. And I think it was so appropriate for us to open with open up your heart. Um, and singers, I just want to share with you, I, I met um, Mr. Kotner last August in uh, Santa Monica at our friend Nadine's backyard. And um, shout out to Nadine. Thanks for joining <laughs> us. And we've kept in touch um, throughout the year. And you've really given me a lot of hope. And, um, and, and, and Ben is like the most humble. He's extraordinary, as you can see, and uber brilliant. He's a genius. And here he is. You know, we're, we're just these conversations that we've been having throughout the year. And then with the pandemic, he was actually scheduled to fly to Chicago. And you know, you know, I'll leave that in your court. But I just want to say thank you for, you know, even seeing us and believing in 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 the story um, uh, and the work that's being done here. And um, I, I mean, I'll turn it over can to I, you. We have a lot of questions. Yeah, but I just can I can I, can I talk yeah. about CCC? Yes. You know, and and like 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 Josephine said, we met last August, and when I heard about the work that she was doing and that all of you were doing, it blew me away because I'd never heard of anything like it. And uh, the idea that there was an organization this large and achieving so much on such a big scale and that this should be replicated around the world. And I, it was one of those moments where you just like, how do we get more people to know about this? Mm -hmm. And so we started talking about, oh, well, maybe, you know, we could follow what you guys do and, 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 and observe. And that's what we do as documentarians is just kind of observe what the story is to figure out if there's a story you want to tell there. And lo and behold, we get scheduled to come out and do a little bit of filming with you for a week. Literally the night, the, the night before uh, CCC decided to, to shut down. So we didn't get on the plane the next morning. Um, but I think it, it, it sort of struck me personally that an organization whose entire mission is the bringing together of people of, 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 of and especially in a city that's that, that's segregated in so many ways the 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 power of physically bringing people together and how that is such an important thing to do that the, this organization does in so many ways and the idea that we're so uniquely in a global crisis that is separating people and all of those divisions are becoming more and more apparent and that segregation and the lack of ability to bridge those gaps, except for digitally, thank you, Zoom. Um, but there are so many obstacles, I think, and in terms of, of understanding each other's experiences in life, uh, that uh, the idea of how an organization like yours, it, it just highlights how important it is. And I'm so excited to see over the next year how you come back and I have a feeling, having met several of you, that you will come back with a force, <laughs> and it will not be. Uh, it will. Uh, it will be a huge part of the healing of not just Chicago, but I think uh, you know the world at large in terms of bringing people together and understanding how important that mission is. So mm -hmm. I'm just blessed that I've been a witness to it. So I'm happy that a lot of you have shared your experiences with me. I look forward to hearing more of your experiences and, and getting to know, you know, just just what what you're going through through all of this experience and 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 where things are gonna go through the next year, we'll see. But um, I, you know, I just uh, really blessed to have have stumbled upon, uh, across such a great uh, light in, in, in a crazy world. I love you so much. Love you. Albert, should we uh, answer So yeah, uh, we have some questions from the Choir coming in right now. Um, Lulu asked a wonderful question. Um, 
at what points have you felt, if, if at all, uh, that you've succeeded with your career, right? To you, what does it mean to succeed in art and filmmaking? Ooh, that is such a good question. Um, I, I think, especially when you live in LA, success is a very, very like weird thing. And, and Chicago is a big city, but Hollywood's unique. <laughs> and so I think there are many different ways that you can view success. I, I, I feel lucky that I come from Indiana. So our, like the way I grew up, success was measured a bit differently. Um, I think success for me are those moments when I have been proud to accomplish something that I didn't know I had in me um, or that I helped someone else accomplish something that that otherwise would have been hard. Um, the easy ones, the easy victories are, are never as good as the hard victories. I think that's uh, in terms of success. Um, and, and I think that's the real key is is that I think we always imagine there are things that are beyond our capabilities. And when you push yourself to those things, those are the ones that, that, that really count the most, I think, when you actually do realize that you do have it in you. Mm. Truth. Um, so some other singers are asking, um, what advice would you give to someone who wants to pursue a career in the arts uh, or filmmaking specifically? Um, in art, I think, you know, you, I, I, I think it's important to examine, like, what are your goals if you're going into the arts? Mm -hmm. I think some people go into the arts because they want fame or fortune. Um, some people go into the arts because they have a, like some, a story to tell or something to express. So defining your goals, I think, will maybe send you down different paths. Mm -hmm. um, I think... Um, follow your curiosity and whatever whatever field that you're pursuing allow yourself to immerse and the things that you don't know about it actively seek out ways to learn about them because you're going to need to know about the all the aspects whether it be if you're doing music you need to learn how to read you know I, I don't know no music at all but <laughs> you might want to learn something about mixing because that'll make you a better you know whatever artist uh, the analogy in film, I think, too, is like you, you want to know everything from I'm taking a, like during COVID, I'm taking a cine cinematography class because that's something I was never classically trained in. And I, I, I think just continuing to expand your knowledge in the area that you're in, even if it's not something that I'll ever do as a career, mm -hmm. it helps me in talking to the cinematographers that I'm communicating with. Um, so also, um, my, my one, f I think kind of funny advice for aspiring filmmakers, mm -hmm. the big mistake that most make is that they watch all the good movies. And mm -hmm. when you, when you only watch the great movies, you're essentially going to keep copying, trying to copy what they do. Mm -hmm. I think you need to watch the bad movies. And I think, you know, well, well, bad subjectively, but if you watch a range of movies, you can see how different people try it and what works and what doesn't work. And then you can start to, to, to kind of learn from that and understand, you may think you're doing something groundbreaking, but really 50 other people tried it already and it didn't work. So it's one of those things where the more you expose yourself to, even if it's not getting the attention of the critics, it's not getting awards, I've learned more from those films than from anything, so just keep stretching yourself and exposing yourself to as much as you can. I love that. We just had um, our alum, uh, Bryce Armisher, join us uh, our rehearsal last Saturday just to kind of share his experience. And he's at Primary Wave right now in LA, A&R, and, and works with Kanye. And he was talking about, um, he lo he sang his entire career at the opera. And, and he said, I'm in studios and you know, I'm just so glad. I'm on the business end of it, obviously, but it's so yeah. funny to me to hear people like describe musical terminology, like uh, executives who don't have the musical knowledge, they're like, yeah, make it more milky. You know, to your point of taking that cinematography, it's like, did you mean make it legato? <laughs> <laughs> so it's important to equip yourself with that knowledge, singers, as all of you, you know, whatever you pursue, the fact that they have this foundation. So I love hearing that you're taking this cinematography class just so you, you know, since you weren't classically trained. Let's see that. Love that. Yeah, and my music knowledge is, is completely non-existent. So much so that when I first worked with a composer, I was like, I like, I like that harpy thing. What is that? And he's like, you mean the piano? <laughs> 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 it's 
Like, oh, embarrassing. <laughs> we have a few more questions, don't we, Albert? Mm -hmm. um, so one question of my own, uh, you spoke a bit about um, sort of going through the, the pandemic and what you're doing right now with uh, sort of immersing yourself in more learning. Um, as a, you know, documentarian, uh, what do you see as the sort of important artifacts that people are going to be looking back, uh, you know, a after the pandemic, people are going to be looking back and taking away from coronavirus? What are the sort of stories that you think people are going to be portraying and what are the sort of, you know, ephemera that people are going to be tracing to try and figure those stories out? Yeah, we've been talking a lot about this, both with my team and with other filmmakers, because uh, so many people are. It's such an important story. It's going to have such big implications on our lives. It's having implications on a very personal level, and but also mm -hmm. on a big kind of global systemic level. Uh, and it also raises so many questions of things that were wrong in the system to begin with. So I think on one front, there will be a lot of investigative pieces that are looking at it from a, from a socio-political kind of uh, mm -hmm. a way, which is important. I think there will be a lot of really intimate personal stories that come out of this that, you know, there might be some people at home right now making their own personal story and their experience about this that end up being a beautiful like portrait of of that experience. Um, I think there's also the difference between like telling the news story of what's happening now versus the uh, looking back on it with context. And mm -hmm. I think that's actually to me, I'm interested in, you know, 10 years and five, 10 years now from now, I think there'll be a lot of people or, or some of the best ones that are made that really do pull back and are able to look at it with a, a sense of perspective and context and of the, the, that history gives you time time and history give you. Um, you know, like Ken Burns makes films about things that happened a hundred years ago, but uh, it's you're really able to see it through a different light. So I think all of those will be great. And that's, that's why there will be, you know, it, there can be so many things that exist about the same thing that tell such different stories. And that's part of the beauty of it. Mm -hmm. Oh, here's a good one. If you could sit down for lunch with one film director, who would it be? Ooh. Goodness, living or dead, <laughs> anything. Um, oh, this is gonna stump me. Um, Fellini, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think there, uh, I, I think Werner Herzog, like he's, you know, I, I met him once and, and the man talks nonstop, but everything he says is endlessly fascinating. <laughs> and I, 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 there's just something so entertaining about hearing him talk. And uh, it wouldn't be a conversation, it would be pretty much just be listening to him talk for an hour. <laughs> I know a few people like that as well. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, we have a few questions left. Albert, would you like to take it away? So um, as a kid or even now, uh, who are, uh, who were or are your inspirations uh, or role models uh, that help you keep going in a tough time? Sure. Um, I would say, going back to Greg Rocky, that was one. I think there are so many filmmakers who specifically related to film. I think there's so many filmmakers who um, did things long before anybody else thought to, to see them. And uh, there are filmmakers like Barbara Koppel that inspired me when I was making my film. Um, uh, legends like that, people who just saw the world in different ways. Um, and, and they're not necessarily the big, big directors that are, are household names. Um, it's, it's people, there's, um, you know, um, uh, yeah, just, you find these gem films that it's not even that they're popular. It's that you watch them and you find it like beauty in them. People who put their heart into making those, not knowing if it's gonna, you know, get a big distribution or anything. If, and, and sometimes when you find those that speak to you, that's, I think, powerful. That's because we all are looking to like find stories that we connect with. And 
it's those filmmakers who have made those films that aren't just the lowest common denominator, like mainstream, every like something that mm-hmm. is, you know, the kind of mainstream pop culture. Um, not that I don't enjoy mainstream pop culture too, I very much do, but um, I think it's important to find those kind of unique individual voices that stand out. For sure. Mm-hmm. I love that. Um, Dashi, this is from Jacqueline Gridsdorn, Jackie Gridsdorn, our board member. Uh, when you speak about looking yeah. at things differently, do you find yourself looking at something differently right now? If so, what is it? And how would you describe the way your own brain works? Oh. Uh, what am I looking at differently? Um, I'm looking at... I think the, I don't know how to say it, the, looking at the fabric of the world differently because of Mm. what's going on and how the different experiences of this pandemic are so extreme and how this has shed a spotlight on that and, and maybe recontextualized a lot of the the need to understand those differences better. So a lot like, you know, you can't avoid any story that you're looking at nowadays, looking at it through that lens, or at least I can. Um, My, the way my mind works, like I think is a little bit more random. Uh, And I like to pick up things that I have no knowledge of or no have previous interest in and, and, just like read about them or uh, I'll go down a rabbit hole. Um, I don't know if you, if there's a show right now on FX about Phyllis Schlafly, who is a legendary um, political figure who fought against women's rights. And I became obsessed with her about six years ago. And I went down a rabbit hole of like four years studying her, even though she, I d- agreed with nothing that she stood for. And I actually ended up going and meeting with her several times. And even though it was like this weird thing that I latched onto, but like that's the way my mind work of like, you find this random thing that you just think doesn't make sense in the world. And you want to try to figure out and make sense why that thing exists. I think that's what interests me and drives me to like, keep pulling away at the layers and trying to, to, to get to the heart of what something is. That's beautiful. Beautiful. I think we have one last question. I think you answered, you know, who are your inspirations and role models? Um, Should we, let's conclude with Michaela's question. Yeah, Albert? Uh, So yeah, what advice would you give to someone uh, who wants to pursue a career in filmmaking? Um, I would go back to, you know, like you've got to be a really curious person. So you've got to like Mm -hmm. take the initiative to teach yourself things. Um, and as you teach yourself things, you'll learn more about what you don't know and always like keep that kind of pursuit of learning the things that you don't know. And you have to know what those things are first. So you have to really kind of throw yourself into uncomfortable territory. Mm -hmm. Um, and now I think it's great because so many people have access to equipment that they can make things on their own. Um, Mm -hmm. formal training is a path, but it's not the only path. I think going, you can volunteer at film festivals. I interned at production companies when I was coming out of college. Um, That was a huge way of learning. For me learning, I I learn more from watching the directors that I work with than anything. So the more you can put yourself in a space where other people are doing that thing that you can pick up tidbits and just keep collecting those tidbits and and then you'll decide which ones really you're gravitating towards and you can just keep going deeper and deeper and never stop it's it's like you you this this career as with any career especially in the arts i think is a it's not a a a, a certificate that you achieve and then you do the same thing over and over like you have to constantly be pushing yourself mm-hmm. to l- discover new things about yourself and your craft so just be prepared for a lifetime of learning and being comfortable in that space of uncomfortableness. Well, we so greatly appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us for our- I really enjoyed it. We love you so much, Ben. I love you too. I'm so excited to spend more time with you guys soon. Thank you. Bye guys. Thank you so much.